Do you want to learn the tricks that top leaders use to get the most out of themselves and their teams? Well, Naftali Hoff is here to help. Lead to succeed. Picks the brains of top leaders to learn about their challenges, insights, and best practices. Here's Naftali. Hello, Lead to Succeed Nation. It's Naftali Hoff, and welcome to Lead to Succeed, Episode 56. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Jackie Hermes. Jackie is the CEO of Accelity, a Milwaukee, Wisconsin-based agency that helps software-as-a-service startups get the revenue and grow faster. In addition to Accelity, Jackie is a co-founder of Women's Entrepreneurial Week and advises several early-stage startups. Very active on LinkedIn, she has an audience of over 40,000 followers, earning more than 1 million video views. In addition to her professional involvement, Jackie is an adoptive foster parent who continues to support uh, past foster children, their families, and the community as a whole. Jackie, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Yes, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure. I'm really looking forward to this. I know we've been working on scheduling it for a while. And I mentioned (laughs) LinkedIn. This is where I would love to start because I'm active there as well. Clearly don't have the foundation and the audience that you have. And you've really found your voice. And, and so I'm just curious because I think oftentimes this, this goes a little bit broader, of course, than LinkedIn. The idea about, um, let's call it nature versus nurture, or is it, is it a natural gift versus something that you develop? In your case, would you say that finding your voice, both as a LinkedIn contributor, and I would say even as a leader, is that something that came naturally to you? Or is that something that you felt... Uh, that you needed to develop. And, and as, as an ancillary to that question, how would you advise others who are feeling like, I want to put myself out there, I want to build my voice, I want to contribute more. How, do you, how would you encourage and advise people to really find themselves and put their best foot forward? Yeah, so you asked about my voice on LinkedIn and as a leader. And I would say, as a leader, that came more naturally to me. Um, I guess that even in sports when I was younger and teams in college or high school or whatever, I always just kind of stepped into the leadership position. There was always a leader needed and I was just really comfortable doing that. So that part was natural. My voice on LinkedIn, I would say not quite as much. Uh, I guess I really, I didn't want to do it at first and be one of those people that's publishing content on LinkedIn. I didn't know if I had anything to say. Uh, I didn't know if I would be credible, you know, it's like imposter syndrome. So that one took a lot more to develop. But once I got started, it, it became easier and easier because I just talk about the things that I know and the things that I talk about every day anyway. So I'm drawing from situations with my team or from prospects or things that I read on Instagram. Uh, inspiration comes from everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, that's a powerful answer. And I want to stay on it for a moment because you talked about imposter syndrome. And I think a lot of us, I I see people post about it. I I know that we all deal with it on some level. Basically, this feeling, am I worthy? You know, do I really have something valuable to add? Is Is there a place for my contribution? And will people take me seriously? So we struggle with it. How did you address it for yourself? And how would you advise others, Jackie, to address it, whether it's head on or not, in a way that feels authentic for them, but gets them beyond that, let's call it limiting belief, because I believe deep down that's really what it is, and allow them to genuinely and authentically show up and make a contribution. Yeah, I, I tackle it head on. It's, it's just kind of in, in my nature. I'm sure that answer is not super surprising. But anytime I feel that limiting belief or something that's holding me back, I try to figure out how I'm going to approach it and what I can do to overcome it. Now, overcome, I guess, maybe isn't quite the right word because I still feel it all the time, right? Like public speaking is something that has been a goal of mine to kind of conquer for at least a handful of years. Uh, It used to really scare me and now the audiences are getting bigger, so it still scares me. Um, But with preparation and making sure that you're talking about things that you know and you're taking the right opportunities, I'm getting more comfortable. Um, I don't think that it's imposter syndrome is something that you ever necessarily get over, if that makes sense. Oh, sure does. Okay. So I'm hearing, take it, you know, for what it is, 
attack it, so to speak, head on and, and really work it on a, on a day to day basis. Um, mm -hmm. And, and okay, we could, we could go further with it. I'm kind of curious to get your take on for somebody who feels they're not ready to hit it, you know, head on how they can still begin to make, um, you know, make, make progress there. And I, I'm just going to float out an idea. I'm curious to get your take on it. You know, oftentimes you have people such as yourself who are contributing and influencing and sharing. Maybe somebody like that could join the conversation in a secondary role for, for, for the beginning, kind of get some, some traction there. So they don't feel like they have the responsibility of owning the conversation, but they can contribute to it in a way where they start to feel like there's resonance, there's, you know, there's receptiveness to what they're saying. And eventually they could move into something more um, significant, more of a leader role in conversations like that. And again, I'm saying this for people who may not feel fully ready, but need to do something, take some kind of meaningful action that's going to eventually produce a better result. What are your thoughts on that? I think that it, contributing, so like if we're talking about LinkedIn, uh, I get a lot of messages from people. I want to create content. I'm nervous. I don't want to get on video. Contributing to the conversation is certainly a place that you can start. That's a toe in the water. If you want to put part of a leg in water, you can start with text posts. You can start with photo posts. Um, most people are comfortable with some form of posting since we have Facebook where we talk to our families or we have Twitter where we comment on politics or whatever it may be. Um, you know, and so I think most people are posting in some way, shape or form and just getting started in a way that's comfortable to you is where I might start. Now, I, you know, I jumped right in and just did video because I was like, I really hate the idea of this. I'm just going to go do it. I know that's not everyone's approach, but I think that you have to take steps toward it if you truly do want to overcome it. And when we're talking about public speaking, maybe you go and talk to a table of a handful of people where you're sitting down, you have notes in front of you. Then maybe you graduate to a panel where you get to speak a little bit more off the cuff in front of a larger audience, then you graduate to speaking on your own. There's a lot of paths that you can take, but uh, to me, it's just been a process of saying yes over and over again, even when I really didn't want to. <laughs> nice, yeah, I, I really do appreciate your approach. And I, I try to model that myself in a lot of what it is that I do, especially in areas where I am personally uncomfortable. And even my coaching work today, when I first got started with it, I transitioned out of school leadership. And so for me, it was about hanging a shingle, kind of putting myself out there, continually trying to demonstrate capacity and, and figuring out ways to move forward and say to myself, in effect, what's the worst that could happen if I mess up, mm -hmm. right? What is the absolute worst that could happen? Oftentimes we have these fears that are in our mind and they're kind of taking over and they're, they're creating this whole really bad outcome that could happen that is almost never gonna happen, but we let it develop in our mind as if it's going to. So if we could manage our own worst case scenarios, kind of calm ourselves down, live in the moment like you're saying, I think that that could be a real nice pathway to success. So let's, yeah. let's stay in the space of, of leadership because this really is a leadership podcast. I think the LinkedIn piece is important. All of us um, who are professionals want to use LinkedIn in an effective way to grow our businesses and be known. Um, but I do want to talk about your, your leadership work because your business, um, I see it's growing um, in, in a variety of different ways and you're clearly leading a wonderful team forward. But we all know that leadership is not a... Uh, a linear progression upward. It's not a straight angle, you know, shooting hockey curves, so to speak, all the way up. There, there are bumps in the road. So uh, I'm curious to know because we all fail, but it's, it's learning the lessons from failure that I think really help us take that next step. What would you say, Jackie, was your, um, your biggest either leadership failure or, or hurdle or challenge, and how did you overcome it? I think that my biggest challenge as a leader is ongoing and it's learning to communicate with people in the way that they will receive the message. Um, and, you know, everyone wants to be communicated the way that they communicate with other people. Uh, and I, I have, you know, I'm very straightforward, very to the point, and I've communicated that way for much of my life and probably pissed some people off and rubbed them the wrong way. And so recently I've really been trying to concentrate on 
figuring out how to have better conversations. I was, I had read Radical Candor a few years ago and reread it again. Um, actually, I just finished it and I'm just reframing and thinking about how I have conversations with people to make sure that I really understand them and can get to the root of any problem or issue or idea or whatever it may be. So that's probably, I'm very task driven. Um, and so getting more familiar with that people side has been my greatest challenge, I would say, as a leader and something that I'm still very much working on. Okay. I, first of all, I appreciate your honesty. And I will tell you, I could have been, <clears throat> we could have like reverse roles in that conversation because <laughs> I, I have much of the same issue. I like to be direct and I like to really get things done. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar, I don't want to get off into this, but I'll mention it quickly, something called True Colors, which is a leadership, a leadership uh, profile. It's really a personality profile. It doesn't have to be for leaders, uh, but I've delivered a number of trainings on this. And the way you're describing yourself is the way I would describe myself. It's, we would be, a, you know, the color would be green. And the green is mm -hmm. typically task oriented. Um, we're, we're low on empathy. You know, we're not necessarily into the small talk. We want to jump in. We want to solve. We want to get things done. We want to move the needle in the right direction. But the opposite of us, and there are other profiles as well, but the opposite of us would, be, would then be a blue, which is very people-centric and people-oriented and relationship-driven. I need to know that you care about me before I'm really going to engage with you and do the kind of work and this kind of thing. So oftentimes, as leaders, we need to know where we are. We need to know where our people are, where at least potentially they could be. And then we have to ask ourselves, is this approach that we are putting out there something that will resonate with others? And if not, how do I adjust it, even if it's not my personal preference, so that it's best heard and understood by others? And so I, I, I hear what you're saying loud and clear. I get it. And mm -hmm. I, I think all of us, you know, as leaders do struggle because, like you said, we want to do what works best for us. You know, as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a former school leader, so I still do talks on educational coaching. And one of the topics is modalities, you know, intelligences. And so as a teacher, how do I deliver content in a way where the students will best absorb it? So are they auditory processors? Do they like visual presentation, et cetera? And I often say that the way we present it is typically the way we like the information to be delivered to us. And as leaders, we need to kind of think beyond ourselves and say, just because I'm an auditory processor doesn't therefore mean that I should be speaking all the time as a teacher. I need to be thinking about how do I involve movement and how do I involve conversation, et cetera, et cetera. So it really, it really does speak to the same idea. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. So let, let's talk a little bit about... Um, foster parenting, because I think that that's a fascinating piece. And I know that it, it's not sure. just a parenting question. And I, as a parent, can, would, be, would love to unpack it just on that, uh, in that space. But I'm sure it has leadership pieces as well. Tell me some lessons, please, that you've learned from it, how you got into it, and what you've really learned from, from the experience of foster parenting. Yeah, so I have one biological child and one that I adopted from foster care. She was eight when I met her, she was nine when I adopted her, and she is now 13. So she's going into high school next year, which is really, really a crazy experience for me. Um, I got into it, I, so my son was four when I started fostering, and I so didn't want to have more. She so is she, older, she's older, yeah, okay. and that's they, they usually say follow birth order and adopt or foster kids that are younger than your you know, biological children, which I'm not a big rule follower and I did not take that advice. And I can see in some ways where it may be valuable, where you have more tendency to like nurture the younger one and it's easier to form those relationships when they're a little bit younger, but also um, I mean, we've gotten to the same place just with her being a little bit older. I did not want to have more kids of my own. So I had my son, um, he was four, and I knew that I wanted more kids in my life, but I didn't want to have more kids of my own. Plus, um, the kid's dad, he, his family had fostered, um, it actually fostered babies right out of um, the hospital until they were adopted. So that was something that he was very familiar with, and I have a few members of my family that are adopted as well. So it just kind of seemed to make sense. 
Um, we also made the decision while we had been traveling for a full month, which was maybe not the smartest idea because you're not living your day-to-day -day life while you're making these big decisions. Uh, but just as, I mean, a theme you're probably seeing, I just dove in and figured out, you know, how to, how to do it, what classes needed to be taken, what kind of children we wanted to accept, like did we want emergency placements, did we want only adoptive placements. Etc. There's a lot to figure out. I am not actively fostering anymore, but I'm really glad that I did it. Thank you. Yeah, and and so so tell me a little bit about your um, the the support that you're involved with, because because I as we read about before, you know, it's not just your own personal experience, but you're part of a of a broader community. Yeah, it's uh, it's everything from keeping in touch with the girls who I fostered who are no longer in my home. So my first foster daughter went to live with her aunt and she had four siblings who all live with her aunt now and we keep in touch with them. Um, same with my second foster daughter who is now, she, she's 10 um, and she is back living with her mom and we keep in touch with them. She still comes over here and there. And then it's keeping a relationship with the daughter that I adopted, her biological family. So we, I just spent some time with her aunt who was in town from Washington and a number of her family members live around here and we keep in touch with them and make sure that she has relationships with them. So you don't really, you know, when you're adopting from foster care, you're kind of getting <clears throat> The, the whole rest of the family too. You know, it's not a closed yeah. adoption where you're adopting a baby and you'll never talk to the rest of their family. So that was, I, I guess I didn't really have expectations around that, but it is, I don't know. I think when you're building a family in this way, you are just a little bit more flexible with how, how you see your family than, you know, just like having biological children and your family that you are like physically related to. Sure. You know, your, your response kind of brings up another point that I discussed in my last, <clears throat> excuse me, in my last podcast with somebody else that you may know on LinkedIn, Gary Travis, and he's mm -hmm. involved with Gively, which is an organization that tries to marry, let's call it corporate giving with organizations that need the support and need the volunteerism and whatnot. So we talked a bit about why it is that nowadays companies are more so than ever, whether it's because of the millennials and the younger workers uh, in the workforce or other reasons, um, the companies are more, let's call it purpose-driven than before. And clearly you're a person of purpose. Clearly you think beyond just making money and growing revenue and building your business. What, what do you see as, the, as, as the, the core driver, if you will, behind that? Why, from your perspective, are so many people as individuals and so many companies at large focusing more and more about giving back and about adding purpose, mission, um, something greater than self uh, to their work experience. Mm -hmm. I think that it's, it, it can be a millennial thing, I guess. More young people in our community right now are more interested in giving back and more involved. But I think in general, it's something that can be passed through families. Like my family has always been very service driven. So that's a decision that I've made personally. We do some volunteering within the company. And I'm also running Women's Entrepreneurship Week, which is a different way to give back to the community. So I think it can be driven by a number of different things. And I don't want to say that it's a a play to retain employees because uh, for most companies, I think it's not, but for some it's a, you know, it, a box to check, I guess. Like this is something that's becoming more important as the years go by and therefore we have to offer stuff like this. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that it may not be driven by that, but the bottom line is if you don't offer it, it's a big, it's a big X potentially mm -hmm. in terms of what, what, where people could be looking. And since, the transience, the, the transference, if you will, between company to company, people who will, they won't stay very long often, our newer employees. And we want to hold on to them because you invest so much in their training, you invest so much in building relationships, and it's hard to start over. So we yeah. want people to stick with us for the long haul. L let's stay in the service piece for a moment. And it actually segued beautifully into my next question. I'm not going to ask the whole thing at this point, but I want to talk about specifically somebody who's looking, since you are an advisor and you do help mm -hmm. female entrepreneurs in particular uh, to develop their businesses and their leadership and whatnot, uh, what advice would you offer to somebody who wants to become an advisor 
as well as what advice would you offer to somebody who is looking for an advisor? And I'm thinking, by the way, advisor as mentor, as opposed to coach, they are different. Um, but either way, however you're defining it, again, from the perspective of the one who wants to do the advising, as well as the one who wants to receive it, what advice would you offer? Yeah, people reach out to me here and there asking how you get to a place where you're advising people or speaking on these topics. And that's not something that I necessarily pursued. I, I just worked really hard on my company and to get to the place we are now and you know where I want to go in the future. And I think naturally those opportunities often start coming to you when you are working hard and you're building a successful business. Um, people want to learn from people who have done it or are in the process of doing it, like I think I am. And so that is really, I guess, how I got involved. I mean, there are also opportunities that are more structured as well. So for example, in Milwaukee, we have a program called the Commons where they bring together students from all of these different colleges across Southeastern Wisconsin, and they give them nine weeks and teach them how to build a company. And they're constantly looking for mentors, coaches, et cetera. Before I was here, you know, with the size team that I have and everything that we're doing now, when we were much smaller, I started coaching there. Um, I knew that I didn't have all the experience, but I knew that I had value to add. And I had the time at that time to do stuff like that. Um, and on the flip side, when you're looking for coaching or mentoring, I think you just really have to ask, you know, and it, it, to get the mentors that I had when I first started, it was really a process of identifying who I wanted to model after, who I thought was 10 steps ahead of me, and asking for either informal copies or a more formal mentoring relationship. And now I'm looking for different mentors because I'm always looking for people who are at the next step where, you know, where I want to be. And the mentors that I've had um, continue relationships with them and they're moving forward in their careers too. So you can kind of evolve together. I have a number of mentors that are both formal and less formal relationships, um, but all very helpful. Yeah. When you say, when you talked about asking, there's a lot there, by the way, but when you talked about just asking, it reminded me of the quote from Wayne Gretzky, who said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And so yeah. we need to be able to put ourselves out there, take the risk, ask the questions. But like you said, find the people who are ahead of you, find the people who have done that and have what to add. And when you reach a certain point and those mentors may not be able to take you to the next level, find the next level because there's always that next level out there. So that was a very powerful answer. And um, so here's another question for you because you're constantly sure. creating content. You talked earlier about going on Instagram and other places to find uh, inspiration and whatnot. Um, but because you're busy and you're building your business and you have all that stuff going on both personally and professionally, how do you, I know for myself that if I'm not going to continue to find ways, which is not easy for me to read, for example, it's hard for me to find the time. I do listen to audiobooks much more and that's how I learn a lot. How do you find opportunity to learn to develop best practices and things like that so that you can give, whether it's to your team, to your audience, to all parties, how do you continue to ensure that you're current and that what you're, what you're sharing is fresh and you feel really good about it? I very specifically curate the information that I want to take in. I think that a lot of people can get information overload where they're reading five books at a time and they are listening to podcasts and they're having a zillion copies of people. It's very hard to act on that amount of input and information. And so I've found that, like, for example, I very much limit the news. I don't watch the news. I don't read much of the news. I have one newsletter that gives me 10 highlights of what happened in the world the day before. I read 10 sentences or two sentence little blurbs, and that's, that's it. And I'm really limiting the amount of information I take in. I have specific podcasts that I like to listen to. I'm constantly listening to audio books. Um, so it's really... I only like to take in the amount of information that I know that I can go and do something with. Otherwise, I've found that that overwhelms me and it is kind of stressful for me. So I've really come up with a system around it. So, so in, that, in that answer, um, do you listen, so to speak, with an agenda? In other words, do you go in and say, I want to learn about X. So here are the books, so here are the podcasts that are going to teach me about X. Or do you start with, I want to learn and maybe there's a, um, sort of like an open-ended approach. And then from there, you take what you learn 
and you use that for your content. So I hope the question was clear. In other words, are you going yeah. in with strategic outcomes that you have to sort of find, or do you let the learning process evolve and then just pick cherry pick things that, that really resonate with you and you think will resonate with others? I would say it's a little bit of both, but when we're talking about things like audiobooks, I am specifically identifying things that I want to learn or things that I want to know more about, and then I am reading those books. Um, I have a big old backlog, I think a lot of people do, of books that they want to read and podcasts that they want to listen to. And so I find myself um, like listening to podcasts that are more about mindset in the morning so that I can get in the right mindset before I start my day. And then I have like this, this quarter, I've been working on that communication piece, more, more clear and open communication with my team and people around me. So I reread Radical Candor. Um, I would say I'm pretty specific about it, but that also can change over time. You know, it depends on what your priorities are, what you're looking to learn and you know, what you see along the way, just like you said. Nice. Okay. You have taken us to a good place at the end of this segment <laughs> so much already. And now we are going to pivot. So Jackie, with our rapid fire, which starts now, it's short answers right to the point of the best you can. If you could plaster a message on a massive billboard, what would it say? Just take this up, get it done. Get it done. Two neat things about living in Milwaukee. Super underground. Not a lot of people know about it. And the people are awesome. Really friendly. Really friendly. That is true. All my years in the Midwest have, have, uh, uh, have affirmed that. What are you not very good at? <laughs> uh, sometimes emotional intelligence is not my strong suit. Noticing when people are uh, upset with me or, you know, or they want something from me that's unsaid. This last one ties into something you said before. If you were being repositioned from CEO to sports coach, which sport, which sport would you want to coach in? Ooh, I don't know. Football? I don't know much about sports at all. <laughs> oh, I thought you said that you played ball when you were younger. Maybe I missed that. Okay. Either way, that's totally fine. So, so give us an give us a window, a broader window now into what it is that you do as well as where people could reach you. Yeah, so um, like you mentioned at the beginning, I'm running a marketing agency that focuses on growing B2B software startups and scale-ups. So we're in Milwaukee. We have 16 or so team members right now. And I'm also running Women's Entrepreneurship Week in Milwaukee. It's our second year. Last year, we hosted over 60 events. This year, it's May 11th through 16th, and I suspect it's going to be as big, uh, if not bigger, than last year, which we're excited about. And in my free time, I'm also working on getting my pilot's license. So that is something I've been working on since about last summer and hope to be able to fly a plane solo this year. Wow. Pretty crazy. <laughs> that, is the, uh, that is pretty crazy. I did see a post about that, or maybe even a couple. And uh, having just returned yeah. from a skiing trip with my kids, first one in about five years and still, you know, dealing with the soreness from that experience. I can imagine if I could barely get myself down a green that uh, taking it up to the skies would probably be a bigger challenge for me. So I can appreciate <laughs> what you're talking about uh, from a, from a uh, next step, next level. Um, but I, you know, I, I think to me, the biggest inspiration from our conversation, Jackie has been, you know, the idea that, we never know that we're, we're quite good enough to do whatever it is that we want to do. But if we don't take action around it, we'll never get there. And so I, I really do thank you for, for being here. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to leave us with one final life lesson that will tie our conversation together and leave us on a high. Uh, the biggest lesson I've learned in life is to face your fears in every single challenge head on. And if you say yes to something that you don't want to say yes to and you commit to it, you're going to have to go and do it and you're going to force yourself to move forward. So that's how I've gotten where I'm going or where I am. And I assume that's how I'm going to get where I'm going in the future. too. Yeah. And the sky's the limit. Please pardon the pun. So, so thank you so very much for being <laughs> with us, Jackie. It's been great. I've enjoyed the conversation and it really was worth the wait. So I'm looking forward to getting to know you better and continuing to consume your content. And I hope that we will have other ways to engage, not just virtually, but hopefully in person one day. Again, thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, thank you for all the lessons you've shared. Absolutely. Thank you.
You got it. Have a great day now. You too. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and for investing in yourself so that you can lead to succeed. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Your feedback gives the show more social proof and encourages more folks to listen. 